So we've been in this series called Kicked in the Faith for several weeks, and we have two more installments. Next week, we're going to finish up the series, and then the following week, and, and hopefully you received an invite card on your way in, but if not, you can get one on your way out. We have them printed out for you of an invite card for our next series, and the next series is called Miracles. So we're, we're in a season within our church to where the next, we're actually over several months, we're kind of in a similar theme. And what I want you to, to see is, uh, and, and not just to see, excuse me, but what I want you to do is, I want you to, to look around, and if there's someone around you that, who, you that you can't see is struggling with their faith, maybe invite them into the miracle series. Because what we're going to be talking about is the miracles of Jesus and seeing what Jesus did, still believing what Jesus can do. Amen. So we're going to see what Jesus did and still believing that what Jesus can do. So again, we're, we're in a similar theme of faith, but we're going to look at it from a completely different perspective. If you see somebody who's struggling in their faith or they have no faith at all, that would be a great, great series to just invite them in and just to, to be encouraged and to see what Jesus did, to be reminded what Jesus still does. Well, today we're eventually going to end up in Job 42, Job 42. If you look at in your Bible and it looks like job, we don't pronounce it. That's not job 42. Um, maybe that's what you do. That's job number 42. We pronounce it Job, although there's no E at the end, but just go over there with me. We're going to be in Job. And what's interesting about Job is his life is a life that none of us want, but it's a life many of us already have. His life is a life that if you've read it, you're like, oh my goodness, like, I don't want Job's life, and yet many of us find ourselves walking down a very similar path, even though we never chose that path. But out of God's providence, that was what we talked about last week, some of us find a path where we're walking. It seems like very similar to what Job walked. Job is an interesting part of the Old Testament because there are five Old Testament wisdom books or compilation uh, of wisdom books. There are five. And, uh, and out of the five, we see Job, and Job is one that stands apart. So I want to just talk about three of them real quick, and this will allow us to really understand what it is that we're going to read um, and, and to learn from and to gather some application uh, the further along we get in this talk. So the first thing I want to talk about is Proverbs. Uh, Proverbs, the, the big idea for Proverbs is God is wise and just. And if you were to put something in parentheses, and people get what they deserve. So it's, you see things in there about laziness, and it says in, you know, just an absolute paraphrase, uh, laziness or hungry. Well, you know what? Doesn't take a rocket science to figure that out. No worky, no foodie, right? Like you, it doesn't, it, you, can, you can put that on your social feeds later, at Chad Zook, whatever you want to do. Anyway, it's like we just know there's some things that are common sense. It's like you get what you deserve, and yet here becomes a challenge. Then you go to Ecclesiastes, and you look at Solomon. And you see something that's different. The, the general theme of that, the world isn't fair. Or maybe in parentheses, people get what they don't deserve. So it's two, again, in the wisdom literature, both of them inspired by God. Both of them need to be in the Bible. And yet both of them give not completely different ideas. It's very similar ideas, but it just displays something of God. But then in Job, we see the culmination, the coming together of both of these ideas. So in Job, the, the, the big question in all of Job and all of the 40-some chapters of it is this. Is God wise and just, and can he be trusted? Is God wise and just, and can he be trusted? So you see how it's the merging together of Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, and, and those become great backdrops of understanding what's going on in Job's life. So in, in, in Job's life, and what becomes very problematic for most people, if you've read it, is it seems like that Job gets something that he doesn't deserve. He himself is a, is a wealthy landowner, got a family. Everything seems to be going incredibly well. And then in his journey, he, he gets to a fork in the road, so to speak. Really, it's not really a fork. It's, it's kind of like just a, an abrupt turn. And, and it all starts with, Satan and God having a discussion, and Satan is wanting to test Job's faith. And Satan is accusing Job, and he says, the only reason Job is the, is the man that he is is because he's wealthy. And what, 
what Satan is then having this correspondence, this, this communication with God about. He says, I bet, Satan says, I bet if I could take all of the things away from him, I bet he would curse you. I bet he would turn away from you if, if I could just take his livestock, take his family, take his well-being. I bet if I took those things away, his whole life would be shattered and he would actually turn against you, God. Of course, out of God's providence, we see that this happened. That the wealthy landowner, and this is just the path that God chose for him, the wealthy landowner and owning cattle and a rich family, he loses it all. He loses it all. And yet in the challenge of this, you, if you just read it, you would say, well, man, how in the world did, did Job get chosen as to be the one who would have to go through this? So again, many of us would say, well, I, I understand what happened with Job, but I don't want Job's life because it seems like Job got what he didn't deserve. We, we just think of things naturally, I think logically, of certain things um, deserve other things. Like, for instance, if somebody commits a felony, most of us would agree that there should be some sort of payment and retribution because of that felony. Could we agree with that? Now, the severity of it would probably disagree, but you're saying there's something there. Or maybe in your household, maybe you, uh, maybe you have multiple kids. Maybe you were the kid, and there's a bunch of kids in your household, and yet for some reason, your younger brother gets away with everything, but yet all of the older siblings didn't. And yet, as an older sibling, you're sitting back and like, whoa, 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 whoa. He deserves, some, he deserves what I got. Wouldn't we say that? Or what we said as we, when we were raising our kids and our kids would do something wrong, we said that, that the crime fits the time or the time fits the crime. Like we would mix it up and say, the, this is, the reason why you got in time out, the reason why you got this sort of this discipline is because you deserve it because you did blank. We just naturally think of that, and when we get in a storyline of Job, we're like, he gets what he doesn't deserve. Another illustration would be this. It's basketball playoff season, which means that's about a three-month period. If you follow the NBA, it like goes on forever. Like the, the playoffs and the finals, it's like, it, it's like as long as the season, it feels like. But say back in 1996, and some of you weren't born then, so I'll, I'll give you a history lesson um, and bore you with it if you don't care. But back in 1996, the Chicago Bulls were everything in basketball. They had this player, an average kind of player out of North Carolina by the name of Michael Jordan. He was an up-and-comer. They had won a couple championships at this point. Okay, he wasn't an up-and-comer. He was amazing. He was the best basketball player of all time. I still think that he still is the best basketball player of all time. And he, Michael Jordan is 6'6". So now picture this. Your team is, is the Chicago Bulls. It's Game 7 of the NBA Finals. Uh, the, it's Game 7, which means you're tied... 3-3, and now the score's tied. There's four seconds left in the game, and now they call a timeout. All they have to, all the Chicago Bulls have the ball. All they have to do is inbound to one player, and they have just enough time for one shot. Well, who do you think the ball deserves to go to? Somebody tell me. Michael Jordan, right, because he's the best basketball player of all time. Wouldn't it be weird if, they, if, if, if Phil Jackson, the coach at the time, he says, you know what, Michael, like, I know you've scored like 45 points tonight. I know it's been like a big night for you, but, you know, but Randy Brown, he, he sits on the bench and he's at the far end of the bench. He's a little shorter than you. He's 6'2 and you're 6'6, but I want to give him a shot. As a matter of fact, Michael, if I'm the coach, I just want you to sit down and I'm going to bring Randy right off the bench and I'm going to allow him to take the last shot. That would be weird, wouldn't it? Why? Because as good as Randy Brown is to be able to be in the NBA, he doesn't deserve to take the last shot because Michael Jordan is the best basketball player of all time, right? So we just have this natural thought process that people get what they deserve, or I deserve something. And with Job, it gets confusing because in the midst of his, of his, of his story, we see that he gets some things that he, it seems like he gets some things that he doesn't deserve. And what makes a Bible reader pause when reading Job is simply he doesn't get what he deserves, what he deserves. At least that's what it seems like as just a general read. Here's an, another underlying tension in all of, really all of the Bible. And when it comes to being kicked in the faith or having a trial that's happened to us or you deal with a loss or anything like this, 
Uh, one of the other things that we try and wrestle with is this. Human beings want easy answers to hard questions. And it just doesn't work that way. Well, human beings, we just want the, we want the easy answer. Give me the, give me the three steps. Give me the, God, give me the five steps. Give me the, if I have to go through this, just please highlight my path along the way and let me know where this is going to end. Because if you let me know where this is going to end, then ultimately I'll know that it's worth it because we think that we deserve better. So human beings, they want easy answer to hard questions. It just doesn't always happen that way. Sometimes we endure things, we get kicked in the faith, and all that we're left with is a great big question mark. And we have to trust God in the middle of it. The bottom line for all of this is, is pretty simple. Whatever God does is right, and a follower of Jesus must accept it. Whatever God does is right, and a follower of Jesus must accept accept it. If we don't accept it, then we're not going to learn what it is that we're supposed to learn. If we don't accept it, our character isn't going to be shaped in the way that, that God wants to shape our character. If we don't learn what we're supposed to learn, the very people that we're supposed to influence by, by people watching us endure this, then they're not going to get what it is that they're supposed to get from watching us endure it with God's help. So again, Job, is, he's a good steward of God. His faith has never been tested. So his story is a, is a really simple one and a really sad one in many ways. And because of all the things that Job has endured, he asked God this question. He said, if I have sinned, what have I done to you, O watcher of humanity? I don't know if he's saying this in a condescending way or if it's, this is just from his heart or this is sarcastic. I'm not really sure. I think there's some breakdown in language because I think if somebody were to say, oh, watcher of all humanity in, in the English language, we would sit back and say, eh, he's probably being a little sarcastic. I don't know that about Job. We may be, that may be projecting from our language to his. I'm not sure. But what is clear is he thinks that there's a certain sin that is brought about, like a certain sin that's brought about the consequences that he's in the middle of. It's because his friends around him had told him that. Because his wife told him that. Because everybody around him would just simply couldn't understand why he could go through all these things and why he was the one who was chosen. He asked some friends and they said, just give up, Job. The reason why you're going through this is because you've committed this great big sin and now you have great big consequences because of this sin. His wife didn't understand, and his wife just said, if you would just curse God and just get it over with, you would be better than this misery that you're in. But he would have missed it. He would have missed it. He said, if I've sinned, what have I done to you, O watcher of all humanity? Why make me your target? Am I a burden to you? Am I a burden to you? He says, God, I don't get it. Why me? And Job through the storyline of Job, he maintains his own innocence. But I want you to know that, that neither he nor any of us are actually guiltless. He maintains his own innocence as if he didn't deserve it through the story up until chapter 42. And now he maintains his own innocence, but, but none of us are guiltless. This is what the Word of God says in 1 John 1.8. It says this, If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we're going through and, and we're being kicked in the faith and we have a struggle and we're saying, well, God, I don't know why it is that you're bringing me through this. It must be my boss's fault. That's the reason why I lost my job. It must be her fault. It must be his fault. No, the reason why I'm on my third marriage isn't because of me. It's just because these people, God, that you keep putting around me. And the only common denominator with three broken marriages is that person. Right? But if we claim to be without sin, we're actually deceiving ourselves. We're trying to fool ourselves into thinking that we're okay and that God's plan is wrong. And when we do this, the Word of God says the truth is not in us. It's not lived out through us. So when we're kicked in the faith and we're like, and we lose our job, we, we should expect that God is, is bringing us through this. And maybe our responsibility was to be a better employee. And maybe the reason why we lost our job is because we weren't doing what it is that we were supposed to. And maybe the reason why our kids don't talk to us anymore isn't because, well, we just raised bad kids. It's because we're bad parents. 
Maybe the reason why that we don't have a good group of friends is because we're not a very good friend. Maybe the reason why our marriage seems to just, just kind of struggle along and struggle along and struggle along, maybe it's not just our spouse's fault, maybe it's our fault too. And yet if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us and the truth will not be lived through us. Stephanie, who gave her life to Jesus two weeks ago, I quoted this verse in Romans 3.23. And this is what it says in in Romans 3.23. It's just before what you see on the screen. It says, this righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. This righteousness, this way to be right with God, it's not because you're right. It's not because your self-righteousness finally surmounted a level like as if you were be able to, to just build and build and build to be right with God or to be one with God. Do you know they actually tried that in the Old Testament with the Tower of Babel? They literally tried this. Like, let's just build a tower to be, to be with God. Didn't work out really well. Like, you can read that for yourself. It didn't work out well at all. So in this, if we're to be right with God, this righteousness comes from God. It comes through faith in Christ to all who believe. And it's all who have also believed this, what you see on the screen, that there's no difference for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You you cannot possess the gospel. You cannot have true faith in God unless you have acknowledged your sinfulness before a holy God. Unless you have acknowledged that you have fallen short of God's perfect standard, that you yourself are not perfect. But if we deny that we have sin, we're deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. So although Job maintained his innocence, we're going to see that he also had a part to play in his story. And perhaps the reason why that your faith has been challenged, if your faith has been challenged so much, is, is because... God, uh, because God is working through you, but yet you have something you need to learn. There's something you need to unlearn. There's some friends that you need to leave. There's a community of faith you need to embrace. There's there's a word of God that you need to connect with. And there's there's a God that you need to get in touch with. The. As you can imagine, as going through this, Job would want to know why, 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 why? So he wants to know why, and God responds. And let me tell you, he really, really responds. This is how God responds to him. Who is this that darkens my counsel with words without knowledge? So God talks to Job after Job's like, why, why, why? God's response to him is this. Who is this that darkens my counsel with words without knowledge? Who is this who's just spouting out words without any understanding? Who is this that would do this? And the very next verse, I would never want this said to me from God, and you wouldn't either. Brace yourself like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer me. Can you even imagine that? So we have to be careful on, on how we read the storyline of Job then, then for us to say, well, I want to I be with Job in this story. Now God is petitioning Job, and, and now he's, he's turned around on Job. And he says, brace yourself like a man, and I will question you. And you shall answer me. I wouldn't want to be on the other end of that. Then God, and then God explains to Job, that he could not possibly understand what's going on. I want to summarize what, what we've been talking about so far with this phrase. One who cannot undertake God's works has no right to undermine God's ways. And I don't know who originally said this. This is not new with me. But I think this so much summarizes what we see in Job's life. And in how God responds to Job's questioning. That one who cannot undertake God's works has no right to undermine God's ways. Let's see how this plays out in Job, in, excuse me, Job, Job, Job 42. I told you it wasn't. I put it my own word in my mouth. Job 42, starting in verse 2. Then Job replied to the Lord. 
after this line of questioning based off brace yourself like a man. I will question you and you will answer me. Then Job replied to the Lord with these words, I know that you can do all things. No plan of yours can be thwarted. Wow. You asked, who is this that obscures my counsel without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me to know. You said, listen now, and I will speak, and I will question you, and you shall answer me. This is what Job says in verse 5. Look at this. He says, my ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. He says, there were... I'd been talking with you, but now, God, for the first time, I see you. And what he also learned through this is Job learned limitations. Job learned that that his, his understanding is limited. Job learned that his health is limited, that his vitality is limited. He learned that his, his understanding is limited. Ultimately, we have to learn that our lives are limited. That our years and our days and our memories are limited. And that we too must embrace our limitations. I've heard this said several times recently. That in America, that if you were to divide people into first half and second half, that in America we are first half people. And in in being first half people, it's within first half it's, it's like thinking of, of just dreaming of what can I do, what can I do in my profession and make money and have kids and have a job and get all the gadgets and get the car and get the land and get the hunting lease and get the ATV and get the boutique clothes and get the platform and get all these things, all of these things that we strive to do in the first half of life. And and what these people are saying is we're such a first half of life, but what we do is this. And and what what we can learn from Job's Job's story is the value of limitations because if we're first half of life people where we're like, we're always dreaming and striving and reaching and reaching and reaching, then we have no explanation because in anybody who is 40, 50, 60, 70 years old, you know this and you know this because you get tired. You know this because what I call the death of dreams because at the older you get, you have all these dreams about places in the world that you're going to see or things you're going to do, but, but you know this if you're older. Because as you get older, the window of those opportunities, they start to close, don't they? They start to close, where you start to experience the death of dreams. But I want to pose to you, and what we can learn from Job is this, the limitations. Instead of us thinking, oh my goodness, now I need to squeak out all of my life. Like, as the window of opportunity is closing, instead, I want you to see what Job saw. I believe what Job saw is, as the window of opportunity, it closed when he lost everything. But as God was pruning back his life, what God was allowing him to do is lose his false self, but gain his true self. And a true self that's rooted in God. Where the first part was rooted in him, rooted in what he had, rooted in his family, rooted in in how much land and cattle and all that he could possess. And then what God was doing as the the, the window of his dreams was closing, there was a window of purpose that was opening. And as the window of purpose opened, I believe Job couldn't see it. But again, look at this passage. Look at the end of the passage, verse 5. He says, my ears had heard of you, but now my eyes can see you. And I believe what he sees he sees a window of purpose, a window of, of purpose and opportunity opening that he did not see before because all he saw was God closing the window and on the first half of his life, and at the same time, God was opening up. And you know what? On the second half, the window was bigger. Because he eventually got more cattle. He eventually got more wealthy and more influence, and even a bigger family. But that window of false self had to close on him. And, all, and, and it came through his own limitations to experience the fullness of what God wanted as the window of purpose and opportunity opened at the rest of his life. That's what we see in verse 5. And then in verse 
6, notice again what he says. Therefore, he says, because God, I've learned this about you and I've learned how big you are, God, and how big your plan is and how merciful you really are. And I was blaming you. And he says, now I realize that I was looking through the lens of myself. And as that window was closing, he says, now I'm starting to see this other this other window is opening up. But notice how the window opens. Verse six, look at it again. He says, therefore, therefore, here's the transition. I despise myself, he says. He says, I cannot believe I've done this. I can't believe that I based my whole life off of my happiness. I can't believe that I based my whole life off of things that I could possess or power that I had. Now he says, I despise myself. This is the, the prodigal story, is this not? In the Gospel of John, and it says that the prodigal, after he had left his family, left his father and his brother and all that, and he he was in pig slop, and he came to his senses, and then he came back home. This is Job coming to his senses. He says, therefore, I despise myself. Look how that passage, or excuse me, how that verse finishes out. And he says, and repent in dust and ashes. He says, I am repenting of the way that I've lived my life and how foolish that I was. And I repent because as that window of opportunity was closing, he says, all I could do was blame you, God. But now my eyes can see that this whole other window of purpose and opportunity was opening that I could not see before. And those limitations were there ultimately to point him to God. Every limitation that comes by age, that comes by Uh, whatever, uh, uh, your boss saying, no, you not getting the promotion. Instead of getting mad and saying, God, why, why, why? Maybe that limitation is there to help shape our character. And maybe God is closing that window because he's trying to open a bigger one, a more opportunity and more blessing. And it's a bigger and it's a better window and it's full of God-given purpose. Job ultimately became satisfied with God. I believe that, that faith is like a coin. There's two sides to a coin. And with, with Job, and we see this, Job learned about the, the magnitude of God and the majesty of God and the power of God. And at the exact same time, he was learning how small he really was. And that's the way that faith works. You will not grow in faith with God unless you, you grow, excuse me, if you, if you see yourself in light of that, of how small you are compared to the, to the magnificence of Almighty God. It's like two sides to a coin. I want to give you four things to remember, and then I'm going to give you five takeaways. The first thing to remember is this. Remember that your character should always be stronger than your circumstances. And it's not on the screen, but you could say it in in a, a different way. You could always see that your circumstances are there for you to have a stronger character that your circumstances are there for you to have a stronger character. So remember that your character should, should always be stronger than your circumstances. This is what God is up to in a Christian's life. So that when you go through something that you're not completely defeated and you're at the floor, that we can, we can soar above our problems, we can soar above our trials so other people would see us and they would see God in us. They could see Emmanuel, God with us. That God with us isn't just a storyline to be lived out at Christmas. It's God with us that empowers a Christian to be the people that we're supposed to be. That it's God with us, the Holy Spirit of God with us. And it's the, the attributes of the Spirit in us and the fruit of the Spirit in us that gives us the power to be able to do the things that God is calling us to do. And all of those are ways that God uses to strengthen our character. You cannot have an increase in character without an increase of the Spirit in your life. You can't have an increase in character unless you also have an increase of humility, true humility before God. Realizing your own limitations and how how great God is and how powerful God is, and in light of what I just said, I am really small. The scripture that corresponds with this is 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. It says, be joyful, always pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Be joyful always. I'm in a season of struggle and trial and suffering, but I'm going to find joy in that. 
I'm going to walk with God in that. God may have closed that, that window of opportunity, but I'm trusting and I'm believing, and I'm going to live in joy, not just fleeting happiness, but I'm going to believe in joy that God's got a bigger window of opportunity and purpose waiting for me. I just need to be like Job and not look at the small window that's closing, but look at the big window that's opening. But be joyful always, praying continually, giving thanks in all circumstances. Giving thanks, even when a trial comes. God, I don't know what you're up to, but I thank you because I know that through this trial, I'm going to become something that I, I couldn't have been without it. And I know how hard it is. I know what I'm saying is not easy. I'm not preaching to you as if I have it all figured out and I'm the, I'm the guru. I wish somebody else was preaching this message so I could sit and listen to it too. I've been listening to this message for about two weeks now. This is what's been rolling around in my brain. But knowing this is God's will for us in Christ Jesus, this is what God is up to. Another thing to remember is this. Remember that your struggles always lead to strength. That your struggles always lead to strength. That God is bringing you up to a struggle so you can have strength. Not a false strength that's rooted in you, that's rooted in rugged individualism, that's rooted in just some, some white-knuckle Christianity, as long as I can hold on to this thing, even if, oh, I'm just hanging on with one hand, at least I have control. No, you see, in the plan of God is realizing that we ultimately have no control. That's foolishness of saying, I surrender control, and God, I give you control. I know that that window is closing, but that, wind, that first window is about me. This second one's about you. This one was all about what I could do and my dreams and my goals and my aspirations and all of these things, and they're fleeting, God, but I believe there's purpose and opportunity and a great big window of opportunity opening. I'm going to be joyful. I'm going to pray, and I'm going to trust that it's God's will for me, but I'm also going to believe that in the midst of this, I'm going to find a strength that I did not have before, so I'm going to embrace you in the struggle. Romans 8, 28 says this, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him. Notice it says those who love him. I'm preaching this verse next week. I have to be careful not to preach it right now. Those who love him. If you don't love God, this verse doesn't pertain to you. You're an enemy of God. If you don't love God, you are an enemy of God. There's no middle ground. There's no lukewarm. It's either hot or cold. You're either walking with God or you're in opposition to God. I have to make that clear. And that's, that's just the bare bones truth of God's word. And that is the most graceful thing I could tell you. There is no middle ground when it comes to God. You're either walking with God or you're, you're in opposition to God. But those of us who are walking with God, we know that in all things God works. He works, right? For the good of those who love him. So God is working in you for the good of those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. Notice that word purpose. That's the, the purpose. That's the window of purpose and opportunity that's opening. That God, no matter this little window, may be, it may be going down and it's a little bit smaller, but I'm going to believe and I'm going to have hope and, and I'm going to trust and I'm going to find strength as this other window of purpose and opportunity comes. Third thing to remember is this. Remember that God's timing is always perfect. God's plans are almost always different than ours, amen? Like, we set these goals, like, this is what I'm going to do by 25. And you're 30, and you're 35, and you're 40, and you're like, what happened to that thing? I was going to do this, I was going to take that trip. And then God blessed you with five kids, or three kids, or two kids. Or He blessed you with the job, or He blessed you with, with you know, uh, just your own limitation of your own health or something, and it's like, okay, now I'm not doing that anymore. But we tend to make our plan, but God determines our steps, right? It's what we talked about last week, Proverbs 16, 9. Remember that God's timing is always perfect, and rarely do we see it coming. Rarely do, do we see things coming. But believing is, is what it says in Jeremiah, and I believe that this is appropriate for the people of God. I realize the context of this is the nation of Israel, but I do believe this is also a truth for the people of God today. This isn't just for a set group of people in a period of time, and we just shelve this as if this isn't God's word anymore. For I know what God says. For I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you a hope in a future. I believe this is still applicable today for the people of God. If you believe that, say amen. That God, he knows, he has a plan for you. 
that you're in the middle of that plan. It's, it's God's providence. He's, he's working out the days and the events of your life. And it's a plan to prosper you, not to harm you. And it's a plan to give you a hope and a future. It's a plan of opportunity. It's a window of opportunity that God is ultimately doing. And every time that we face a limitation, a struggle, we're in a moment where we, we try and where our life, it seems like, wow, we're like living Job's life. We should be looking like Job in verse 5 of saying, no, 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 there's another window. I just don't see it yet. God, help me to see it. I believe it. I just can't see it. For God's timing is always perfect. Fourth thing to remember is this. Remember that God will never leave your side. You may feel like you're in the middle of this struggle all alone, but I have to remind you that you're not. You could be in the most depressed state of your life. And you emotionally can think that you are all alone, but you are never alone. Somebody needed to hear that. You are never alone. Never. A Christian has has God with them. But even if you're not a follower of Jesus, there are people who know you and who love you. Remember, as the people of faith, that God will... Never leave your side. Deuteronomy 31.6 says this, Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them, because of the enemies. Do, do you believe, if you're the people of God, do you believe that the people of God still have enemies today? Yes. Say amen if you believe that. Yes. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them, because of your enemies. For the Lord your God goes with you and he will never leave you nor forsake you. That you are right where it is that God wants you to be, but God is right with you in it. I thought of some other things that corresponded with Job's life and that really settled in my heart. Uh, These are just bonuses. These are not the five takeaways. They'll be in a moment. But I I thought of this. Job had to lose so he could ultimately win. That the way up is down. That the way up with God is down in humility. Before there's spiritual rebirth, there's a death to self. And then before there's a bodily resurrection, there has to be a bodily death. So there's always, there's always a window that is closing. And those of us who are in Christ know and believe that yes, the, the window of opportunity in, in our days here on earth, they could be closing. But praise God, there's not just a window. There's not just a hallway. There's just this immense space that we can enter as we leave this earth. Amen? Now, let me give you the five takeaways. They'll all be on the screen at the same time. You could take a picture. Just take a picture real quick so we can discuss these without you being totally distracted. Own your part of the story. Whatever season, whatever stage, whatever trial, whatever level of suffering, whatever it is that you're going through, own your part of the story. The best way that you can learn what it is that God wants you to learn in the middle of this while you're being kicked in the faith, while you're having some some Job type of experiences, the best way that you can soar over the circumstances, that you can gain the strength, that you can have a a denial of your false self, you can take up the true self that's rooted in the Holy Spirit of God. The The only way that you can do that is by owning your part of the story. Your acknowledgement of your sinful state, that you may think, well, I'm innocent, but you're not guiltless. You may think, well, I didn't do this to myself. You may be thinking that, but I'm just, I want to encourage you, own your part of the story. The way up is the way down. Second thing is this, and it really corresponds with the first. Don't play the victim. If somebody plays the victim and they think of everything that happens in their life, I can't believe this happened to me, and she left me, and he left me, my kids won't talk to me, my boss fired me, I I can't get a job, I've had job after job after job, and I'm losing my house. Like, stop playing the victim and start owning your part of that story. You should be asking God, God, what did I do to put myself in this situation? You want to set your heart free? Ask God that question. God, what did I do 
to put myself in this situation. I've got this ailment. I've got this struggle. It's financial. It's relational. It's physical. It's, it's marital. Whatever it is, it's spiritual. It's like, what did I do to put myself in this situation? Acknowledge that before God. Do what Job did, and we see in verse 6. He repented. He repented. He owned his part of the story. He didn't play the victim. Third thing, ask godly friends for help. Job did go to his friends. He just got some really bad advice. There are people here who want to give you good advice. And I'm not talking about people who are on the ministry team. I'm just talking about you. As you look around at the people here, there are incredible godly people here who'd be willing to give you the advice. You don't have to go to who you think the professional is. There are, we have just an incredible family here of people who are wise in the Word of God who would love to encourage you and help you to make decisions, maybe help you to make sense of where you are in your stage of life. Fourth thing is this. You can't know everything. You simply can't know everything. God's ways are higher than your ways. His, his understanding is greater than ours will ever be. So what we should do in response to that is just trust in the truth and God's well-orchestrated plan. Just trust in the truth of God's well-orchestrated plan. That, that it's, it's, His way is right and is true and He is wise and He is just and He's caring and He's merciful and He's good. And He's doing it to help you, not to hurt you. He wants to help you prosper, not to punish you. God is up to something in the world and He's up to something in your world. So instead of asking God why, 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 simply lean into these takeaways. Don't be like Job early in his life. Be like Job in this passage who comes to the end of himself and he realizes, I don't have the answers. When Marla and I went to college, we... I had just gotten out of the Navy, and we, we lived in a, a trailer for a little while, and then we moved into this rental house, and it was on 1918 Wall Street, Murfreesboro, Illinois. Like, that was the easiest address to remember, obviously. It's 20 years or whatever later, and I still remember. Uh, it's not because my memory is that sharp. It's just because it's that easy. But we lived at 1918 Wall Street, and um, Marla nor I, we, we can't grow things. Like, I don't know what that's called. There's like green thumbs and people who kill things. And I think we're of that. Like we just can't. My mom, um, she used to give us plants and philodendrons as she would tell us. She's like, we're going to, you know, you cannot kill this thing. I'm like, well, you're testing it by sending it to our house. Like, and that's the way it was. And, and so she goes, this great, she could grow up. My mom could grow anything. And she just this philodendron is hanging down. And I love that thing. It was great. Sat right in the window. We killed that thing. We killed it dead. There was no resuscitating. There was no grab the paddles. There was no giving it water. There was not enough miracle in miracle grow. That thing was just gone. I mean, it was just gone. And that thing, we threw it in the trash. And I don't believe we told our mom, or told my mom, we just kind of left that alone because she would be like, she'd probably want to, well, let me send you another one. I'd be like, no, the story doesn't end well. Well, we move into this house on, on, in, in Murfreesboro, 1918 Wall Street. And lo and behold, right in front of the house, there are two rose bushes, and I'm thinking, oh, good grief. Like, it's the only landscaping. It's a rental. It's the only landscaping. It's like this small area. There's like this nice-sized rose bush, and there's a little stumpy rose bush. And I'm thinking, they're going to be dead rose bushes. Like, this is just bad. So I didn't even want to touch these things. So they, both of them sprouted or wh whatever it's called. I don't know. You guys grow stuff. Whatever. They sprouted roses. Uh, so they grew, they grew at the end of the stem, and the roses were there. You're laughing at me, and that's okay. Um, I'm judging you internally, but like the, the roses, they, they did their thing and the petals fell off and they kind of sat there and lifeless. And I was like, what's the big deal with roses? These things are gross. Like everybody like, ah, oh, I love roses. I'm like, like for what? And so I was like, what am I? I don't even know who I asked, but I said, what am I supposed to do? And some of you already know where I'm going with this. And they said, well, you need to prune them. And I'm like, well, how do you prune them? And, and they said, well, just cut the heads off. I'm like, yeah, let me just tell you. 
Like, they look like they had life. If I just cut the heads off, it's not going to look like any life existed in these things. They're like, no, trust me. They said if you just cut the heads off and you prune it, then after you prune it, it'll actually grow back more full, and, it'll, and, and the roses will be a stronger bloom. And I was like, well, I got nothing to lose, because right now they look half dead. They're probably just going to be fully dead, but we know how this goes. I cut those things off. And you know, many of you already know what happened. Like those things started to just bloom. They were beautiful. I think they were the envy of the street. I took great pride when I cut the grass and I looked over and I didn't get cut with the thorn. And, and I'm just looking at these and I'm like, man, this is just an amazing thing. But you see, the thing is this. I tell you that story for a couple of reasons. For one, I got Amy Burns' permission. She's on the ministry team, on the, in the kids' team. And she, gave, she basically told a story about pruning this morning at our rally. And before our service is at 840, we get everybody who volunteers during the first service, all the difference makers, we get them in room and we encourage them and we pray together. We get centered before what we're going to do for that day. And she told this story about, from John 15 about pruning and the value of pruning. And I asked her permission. So I tell you, one, I, the reason why I tell you the story is because of that. But also is because with Job, his life had to be pruned of, the, of, of what would be his false self so that the true self could truly bloom. And the, and the true self was, was more beautiful. There was tragedy. But as that window of opportunity opened and the opportunity and purpose opened, there was beauty. Just as when I, I pruned those roses back and I cut off the, the dead blooms and they came in. And then when we left, I believe this is right. Marla could correct this later. But I believe when we left, they were both flourishing. And it's just an amazing thing. But I got advice and I took their advice. And maybe that's what you need to do too. Maybe you need to evaluate what's going on and maybe what it is that's happening in your life is God's pruning things for a defined purpose. That that window is closing because God wants it to close because you'll be a better person as it closes so you can see the bigger window with more purpose and opportunity right next to it. 